Thank you very much for coming out on a, um, on a Tuesday afternoon evening for, for this event. Uh, this, is, this is an event being sponsored by ASEMS, which is our ARC Centre of Excellence in Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers. So UTS is one of the nodes of ASEMS, and one of the things that we like to do as part of the centre is to have events like this where we try to um, have presenters who have something interesting to say, but where it's basically how maths and statistics can be used to solve real-world problems. So hopefully you'll enjoy the lecture. I'd also like to acknowledge the, the New South Wales branch of the Statistical Society of Australia. We have our President Jake Oliver over there. Uh, they were a supporter of the event and uh, helped us with some of the advertising and so on. So uh, welcome. I hope you enjoy the presentation and that we have some lively discussion at the end. So I'll turn over to Suzanne, who's going to open up the presentation. So thank you, Suzanne. Suzanne is the acting director at the moment at Bosca, and she'll be telling you more about Bosca. Joanna is uh, a research statistician at Bosca, and she'll be, after Suzanne's presentation, she'll be going into more detail on one of the projects. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. As Louisa said, it's, um, it's a Tuesday after the long weekend, so very impressive you all made it here. I'm a, currently the Director at the Bureau of Crime Statistics and Research. Um, I'm going to be talking to you a bit about how we use data to inform evidence and the applied research that we do at the Bureau. Uh, and also talk a little bit about the, all the data holdings that we have, um, which I'm sure will be of interest to many of the researchers out there. I'm going to touch on a couple of case studies just to give you a flavour of the kind of work we do um, and what sort of impact it's had on policy in New South Wales, but Joe's going to go into some more detail around um, uh, a particular study that she did. Um, so I'm just going to jump over most of the case studies and just give you an idea of what, what the studies are looking at, why they're looking at those things and how the results have been used to inform policy. So just a bit of context, um, this is an article from last year. Uh, the New South Wales Police Association came out and, and said that they needed, that more officers needed to be employed in New South Wales, that there was an epidemic of violence that was just about to happen and that their officers were at breaking point so we needed to employ more officers. However, if you look at the evidence since 2000, we've seen a dramatic uh, decline, uh, mostly in property crime, but we have seen um, significant declines in violent offences as well. So murders fallen by 68%. We've seen non-domestic assault fall by a third. Uh, robbery with or without a firearm has dropped by more than 80%. Uh, shooting with other offences are down. This here up on your, um, your screen is the robbery rate for New South Wales over the last 30 years. And you can see that the robbery rate spiked in the late, 30, uh, late 90s and in the early 2000s it started to decline significantly. So we're now down here at sort of the low levels that we were seeing 30 years ago. So certainly not an epidemic. So we put out a media release um, to try and inform that public discourse around crime and said that there's no evidence to support the union's claim of, of a wave of violence about to happen. And luckily the ABC were good enough to present that balance balanced view in the media. So that's one of the primary objectives of the Bureau, is to inform public discourse around crime and criminal justice issues. Um, we look at factors that affect the distribution and frequency of crime. We look at the criminal justice system, the criminal courts, to see uh, what factors might influence the effectiveness and efficiency or equity of the courts. Um, and most importantly for us is trying to get that information to the relevant people. So we work closely with um, policy makers, administrators within the criminal justice system, as well as the media and the public to try and inform um, public debate around crime and criminal justice issues. So how do we do this? Well, we have three units within BOXA. Uh, the first is the research and evaluation unit. Obviously, they undertake research and evaluation, monitor policies and programs as well. We have a modelling and information mapping unit. Um, so this group supplies data. We have a lot of people that are constantly asking us for data. So we have a data service and we supply that to government, we supply it to academics, to public. 
Um, they also do some simulation modelling, they do forecasting, geospatial analysis of crime, they do, they do generate uh, statistical models, sort of more short-term um, uh, insights into crime and uh, criminal justice issues. We also then have our data systems group and they're um, concerned with maintaining our um, statistical databases on crime and criminal justice. Uh, they link across those data sets and they also link um, sometimes with external data sets as well. But they're constantly trying to improve the scope um, and the quality of those criminal justice data holdings. So we do have audit process which we feed back to the courts and to the police to try and improve the quality of the data. Um, in terms of what we have, Sorry, this is what we do. <laughs> I'll tell you what we have, but this is kind of a typical year in the, in the Bureau. So we have regular statistical reporting that we do, a quarterly report on police recorded crime, on custody data, on the criminal courts is an annual um, publication, but we're moving to a biannual pretty soon. Evaluations, research reports, uh, simulation models, dashboards, um, and this is our data service um, unit that provides data to over a thousand people each year. Uh, the data that we have um, may not be as big as the data that some of you are used to working with. I know Roman deals with much bigger data sets, but uh, we're looking at all of the criminal courts information. It's all criminal court proceedings from 1994. So that's 3.2 million local and children's court criminal finalisations, local court being the largest jurisdic jurisdiction in New South Wales. Almost 100,000 Supreme and District Court trial finalisations and sentenced cases, about 160,000 um, District Court appeals. We also get some data from the police, police COP system. This isn't a full data extract from there. We only get information on criminal incidents that have been recorded by the police. Um, it's up to 17 million criminal incidents, even more if we count driving offences in there. We also, so we have details about those criminal incidents. We also have information about persons of interest that the police have been, that have identified in relation to that criminal incident. Uh, four million <coughs> records there, even more, up to 14 if you include driving offences. And we also have information if the police have collected it about the victims associated with those criminal incidents. So nearly 14 million victims. We have what's called uh, the Boxers Reoffending Database as well. So this was sort of set up about 10 years ago and it, it's a longitudinal database that follows people over time so you can look at all of their criminal courts history um, back from 90, to 1994 to the present. So that contains 1.3 million individuals, distinct individuals and over 3.4 million uh, appearances. So the sorts of things we do, the, the work we do at the Bureau is very applied in nature. That is our focus, that we want to influence policy and practice, so we're constantly looking for those uh, research projects and evaluations that are most relevant to, to uh, practice and policy of the day. One that you've probably all heard a little bit about was the lockout laws, uh, so we did an evaluation of this. Uh, we've done a number of different studies, but uh, the first one was back in um, 2016. And for those of you who don't know, or just to refresh, it was 2014 when um, the Premier at the time, O'Farrell, announced these restrictions on licensed premises, specifically targeting mostly King's Cross and the CBD uh, entertainment precincts. So we went off to see whether these, <coughs> these changes to the liquor licensing laws had an impact. Comparing trends in assault in the King's Cross and CBD entertainment areas before and after the reforms, there was obviously an interest in whether or not there was displacement or diffusion of benefit to the surrounding, immediately surrounding areas, as well as to areas which were um, within um, uh, a sort of within di distance that people could access away from the Sydney CBD. Um, <clears throat> And we use time series structural models, I won't go into those, um, but the idea was to see whether or not the intervention could account for any variation once we took into account pre-existing trends in the data and uh, seasonal variation, which you certainly see in um, uh, assault data when you look at the next screen. So what you have here, uh, both figures are showing you a monthly count of non-domestic assaults over time. We're looking from 2009 to 2017, uh, September 2016, sorry. The vertical line is showing you when the um, liquor, 
liquor licensing laws were introduced and that's our estimated trend line there as well. So uh, on this side is King's Cross and on this side is the Sydney CBD. <clears throat> so you can see King's Cross, there's much more dramatic decline in uh, non-domestic assaults immediately after the, the intervention was um, introduced. Uh, there seems to be a drop in the level and then a downward trend thereafter. So we estimated it was the 32% drop in assaults after the reforms commenced. In Sydney, CBD was slightly do, doing a slightly different thing, it's just a general downward trend after the reforms, and we estimated that at about 26% drop in, drop in assaults. Importantly, they didn't look, at least from this early look, there was some small suggestion later on, but at least early on, there didn't look like there was much, any displacement. Um, if anything, there was a diffusion of benefit to the areas that are immediately adjacent to those target sites, uh, and no displacement to other areas out of the Sydney CBD. Uh, we also looked at the daily time period, so importantly the biggest drops were seen at the times when you would expect them to be seen if it was indeed the intervention that was causing that, that change in trend. So it was between 1.30am and 3am when you were seeing the biggest drops and that's when the lockouts were occurring and the alcohol ceased at 3am, so suggesting that there, that the intervention was the mechanism by which we were seeing these changes in the trend in assaults. Now, as you know, we like to think that it's been kept in place partly because some of the work that we've done here, but it's been in effect about for about five years now. It's now about to be reviewed. Uh, so certainly we'll be looking to see whether or not there's any change in those trends over time. Another one which is looking more so to the criminal courts um, rather than to record a crime, there's a, an enormous problem in uh, court delay and that's been rising over time quite dramatically. Between 2013 and 2017, the median time um, between, for matters that were, were proceeding to a defendant hearing went from 280 nine days to 376 days. So this has a significant cost to government, obviously in terms of people being bail refused and being remanded in custody, but significant cost to individuals as well. If they're subsequently released, they've had a period of time in custody and they might even be released to a, to a non-custodial penalty. Uh, so the government looked at seeing what they could do to try and reduce that court delay. They introduced four, um, uh, these reforms that have four key elements. Additional judges were appointed. They had what's called a special callover. It was sort of like a fire sale where the prosecution and the defence came in and they tried to, to um, reach plea negotiations and to certify charges so that things were, were ready to go once the trial was, was about to commence. They also had these readiness hearings, similarly they'd have senior counsel talking earlier on to try and be ready for the trials, and they appointed some more public defenders. So our question was whether or not it had an impact on finalisations and um, backlog. I'm only going to talk about finalisations here today. Um, again, we used an interrupted time series model to look at changes in level and trend changes. Um, just looking at judges, the appointment of the additional judges, because that's where we found the biggest effect. So the timeline up the top there is showing you when they were appointed. They had two additional judges initially, and then they added three more shortly thereafter. And this is monthly uh, district court, criminal court finalisations over time, with your vertical line showing you when the intervention occurred. Uh, so we found there was a significant impact of appointing those additional judges. We estimated at about 40 extra finalisations per month. Um, there was some evidence for special callovers, not so much for public defenders, although they um, operate through the special callovers as well. So uh, certainly in terms of the judges, there was good evidence. And as a result of this, they're now um, appointing seven more district criminal court judges uh, with the aim specifically to try and reduce that backlog and reduce the time that's spent um, uh, on remand prior to finalisation. The last one I wanted to talk about before I'm handing over to Jo is a particular study uh, looking at domestic violence. So you all know that domestic violence is currently a very high priority for not only the New South Wales State Government but the Commonwealth as well. Um, <clears throat> and there are interventions and strategies that are being developed to try and reduce domestic violence in the community. 
With scarce resources, one of the most important things is that people who are at great risk of subsequent victimisation are accurately identified. Um, at the moment in New South Wales, the police have a risk assessment tool called the DVSAT, uh, Domestic Violence Safety Action Tool, that they're currently using. We did some work around that to see how good it is at predicting repeat victimisation, and it did pretty poorly. In fact, it was the AUC was only slightly above 0.5. So it wasn't very good, it was very long, and it's being, it's being administered for every criminal incident that the police are attending, so quite timely resource intensive as well. So we thought we might look to see whether or not we could do a little bit better with, by looking at um, some data that's collected in a representative, set. it's a representative sample called the Personal Safety Survey that the ABS um, uh, undertakes every year. They have a very large range of variables that they collect information on. Um, they have socioeconomic status, they have income levels, they have mental health, um, they have whether or not people have experienced child abuse, so quite, quite a, a lengthy um, uh, interview that's being undertaken. But they also ask about um, IPV, which is intimate partner violence within the last 12 months. So we look to see whether amongst those people who had, had experienced one, whether or not we could um, use some factors that are collected in that survey to see if we could predict who was more likely to have a second in that 12 month period. Uh, I won't go into how we did it. We used a way to logistic regression. Um, but this sort of shows you, this is a heat map that was generated by Sarah Rahman, uh, one of our researchers. Um, there was only five. Amongst, we had over 35 explanatory variables that we considered for the model. And amongst all of those, there was only five that independently predict, w predicted whether or not someone would experience more than one episode within 12 months. So socioeconomic status, area of residence, uh, whether or not they'd had a disability, whether or not they had a disability. Uh, if they'd achieved year 10 or below in terms of education level, and if they'd experienced at least one episode of emotional abuse in the previous 12 months. So this is just showing you um, uh, the relationship between each of those five variables, um, red being a very high probability, green being a low probability. So it's showing you that in outer if you lived in an outer regional remote, very remote area, uh, you had experienced emotional abuse, uh, you had a low level of education and a disability, and you lived in the most disadvantaged quintile, a very high probability. On the other spectrum, a very low probability. So we're now, we've presented this to uh, Women's New South Wales and to the police, and they're now undertaking a, a review of the DVSAT. Um, as I said, the DVSAT is a very, very long instrument. It's over, it's over 24 questions. This one had five, and we were still doing much better in terms of the AUC. It was about 0.76 for this one. So um, it's suggestive that there is some information that can be readily used in, from administrative data sets to assess risk. Uh, we're not saying that this is all that's needed, but certainly uh, any of these risk assessment tools do need to be validated, and potentially um, you know, empirical work needs to be done around developing uh, better tools. Um, so I'll hand over to Jo to talk about one of her studies in more detail. So I will talk about a project I did in particular, which is comparing the um, reoffending outcome between an intensive correction order and a short prison sentence. So this is an outline of my talk. I'll start with some background to intensive correction order or ICO and present my research question and the data I used, talk briefly about selection bias and why it's important, and the method I use, which is propensity score and instrumental variable, um, and then talk about supplementary analysis we did and finish with some um, concluding remarks. So before I talk about ICO, int intensive correction order, I'll begin by talking about periodic detention. So a period of detention was a sentence of imprisonment that required an offender, a person, to remain in custody for a specific number of days per week, uh, usually on the weekend, and live in the community um, five days a week. Um, so in later stage of the sentence, uh, depending on the offender's compliance, the two days of community service work can be undertaken rather than imprisonment. 
However, there are major limitations and inequalities of periodic detention, including it was not uniformly available across the state with limited access in rural and remote areas, and it's not achieving a deterrent or rehabilitative outcome. And the Crime Amendment Act in New South Wales, which came into effect on the 1st of October 2010, uh, abolished periodic detention as a sentencing option in New South Wales and introduced Intensive Correction Order, or ICO, uh, in response to the limitations of periodic detention. So an ICO is an alternative to full-time imprisonment uh, served by an offender by way of intensive correction in the community rather than in a correctional center. So in New South Wales, an ICO is served in the community um, under the supervision of Corrective Service New South Wales. An offender needs to comply with directions um, from a corrective, su corrective service supervisor as well as mandatory conditions, including minimum of 32 hours of community service work per month, participation programs to address offending behavior, um, and submit to drug and alcohol testing. So programs available to offenders um, include programs targeting um, drug and alcohol issues, um, anger management issues, and programs to improve employment skills or address uh, literacy problems. So when imposing an ICO, apart from the mandatory condition that I just mentioned mm -hmm. above, a court may also uh, require the offender to submit to electronic monitoring, um, comply with a curfew, submit to random unannounced home visits, or, or any other restri restriction or uh, requirements. So this table here just presents the uh, levels in place where, when ICO were first introduced. So offenders are progressed or regressed through these various levels of supervision um, and conditions depending on the behavior of the offender throughout the term of the ICO. So level one condition include a, um, a curfew, electronic monitoring, and at least weekly face-to-face -face contact with a corrective service supervisor. And on level four, there's no curfew or electronic monitoring, and the minimum required face-to-face -face contact is every six weeks. So the default starting level um, for ICO offenders was actually level two, um, except in rare circumstance where electronic monitoring was mandated um, by the sentencing court. And since the introduction of ICO, the levels of supervision provided um, have undergone several uh, revisions. So there are various stages the court must follow before an ICO um, can be made. So the court must be uh, satisfied that having considered all possible alternatives, no penalty other than imprisonment is appropriate. The court then determines the term of imprisonment without regard to the matter it is to be served. A court that has sentenced an offender to imprisonment for not more than two years may take an ICO, directing that the sentence to be served by way of intensive correction in the community. Also, an ICO cannot be made um, in respect of a sentence of imprisonment for a sex offence. And to be eligible, the offender must be at least 18 years of age. The court must refer the offender to the Commissioner of Corrective Service for a suitability assessment before imposing an ICO. And in assessing offender suitability for an ICO, the Commissioner needs to consider a number of factors listed on this slide. So the age and criminal history of the offender, the likelihood that he or she will re-offend, whether there's any risk associated with managing the offender in the community, the likelihood, li likelihood of committing a domestic violence offense, whether the offender will have suitable accommodation throughout the duration of the ICO, whether he or she will have any drug and or alcohol dependency, whether he has any physical or mental conditions, as well as availability of resources and interventions to address the needs of the offender. So a court may grant an ICO only if the assessment report states that the offender is a suitable person to serve the sentence by way of intensive correction in the community. If the offender is assessed as not being suitable, then the court considers whether home detention, suspended sentence, or full-time imprisonment is appropriate. So the aim of my study is to compare the recidivism rates of offenders who receive an ICO with those who are sentenced to a short, i.e. less than two years, prison sentence. Now, why is this an important comparison? New South Wales is currently experiencing unprecedented growth in imprisonment numbers, reaching an all-time high of 13,000 offenders in June 
2017 and a 36% increase from 2013 to 20, 2019. And this rise in prison numbers combined with strong evidence that prison exerts little to no deterrent effect has increased an in urgency to find alternative, effective alternative to imprisonment. And a large number of prisoners currently in custody have, have been sentenced to terms of less than two years in duration and could therefore eligible and potentially suitable for an ICO. So comparing the outcome of offenders sentenced to ICO with those serving a short prison sentence has very important policy implications. So if ICO, we found, is more effective in, than short prison sentence in addressing the underlying causes of offending behaviour and reducing recidivism rates, then expanding their use would have a significant impact on the imprisonment growth rate in New South Wales. So the group of interest in this study consists of all adult offenders who received an ICU as a principal penalty in a New South Wales court between the 1st of October 2010 and 30th of September 2012. And this group were compared with offenders who received a short prison sentence uh, less than two years uh, during the same period. The ICO eligibility criteria that I mentioned before um, were applied to both the ICO group and the prison sample. So accordingly, those who are less than 18 years of age, those who receive a prison sentence of longer than two years, and those being sentenced for a prescribed sexual offence were excluded from our um, analysis. And the reoffending outcome examined is whether there was a further proven offence committed within 24 months free time after the index date. And the index date was defined as the date of the index court finalisation relating to an ICO or a short prison sentence. And the treatment variable is whether the principal penalty was an ICO or um, a prison sentence up to two years. So here's our result. So after applying the selection criteria, eligible records comprise index court appearance of 10,660 offenders in the short prison sentence group and only 1,266 offenders in the ICO group. So the first thing you notice is that there is a big difference between the number of offenders in each group. And this points to the fact that ICO was heavily underutilised, at least during that first 24 months um, since its commencement um, in October 2010. So we found that 24 months free time from the index finalisation, around 30 36% of those in the ICO group and around 58 of the offenders in the uh, prison sentence group have reoffended. So can I conclude that we've just shown ICO relative to short prison sentence is effective in reducing recidivism? Yes, no? <laughs> so what's not taking into account in this comparison? Um, yeah, so the type of offence is taken care of. Um, so what's not taken into account is any systematic differences between the two groups. And what we found is that those who received an ICO were quite different to those who received a prison sentence. In terms of their demographic characteristics, their index offence characteristics, prior criminal history, and prior penalties received. And I'm just going to show you what we... The, the significant differences between the two groups. So first we look at demographic differences. So compared to those who receive a short prison sentence, those who receive ICO, they were more likely to be younger or reside in major cities and less disadvantaged areas. Now with index offence characteristics, those in the ICO group, they were less likely to have a current theft, drug, justice procedure or breach of violence order offence. And they were also less likely to be in higher LSIR risk category. And I'll explain <coughs> what LSIR stands for a bit later. Okay, what's more is they were, they were more likely to have breached a custodial um, order. And when you look at the prior criminal history, um, those offenders in the ICO group, they were less likely to have higher number of um, court appearances with proven offence in the five years prior. 
but they were more likely to have prior offense or fraud exceeding prescribed alcohol content or other substance limit. And lastly, they were more likely to receive a prior, sorry, they're less likely to receive a prior prison sentence or a prior penalty of a driver license disqualification. So the result I've just shown you showed there are non-trivial or statistically significant differences between the groups of comparison. And these differences must be accounted for when we compare the outcomes for the two groups. And this is because these factors which affect the type of penalty received might also affect the reoffending outcome. So any difference we observe in the reoffending outcome might be confounded by these um, factors. So we need to think about what are some of the ways we can use to balance these factors so that we can isolate the so-called treatment effect out, the effect of the ICO. So the observed variables or factors we need to control for, they are called control variables. So the first set of control variables that we include in our model um, is demographic variables, including the age of the offender at the time of the index court finalization, gender, indige indigenous status, uh, remoteness of res residence based on um, ARIA, Accessibility Remoteness Index of Australia, uh, with area categorized into uh, major cities, in the regional, outer regional, remote, and very remote. Uh, Social Economic Index for Area, CIFA, uh, which represents a disadvantaged score of residents, divided into quartiles, with the lowest being most disadvantaged. Now, the second set we include is um, index offense characteristics. So we include the number of proven concurrent offenses and the uh, offense types. So we create a binary variable for each of these offense types. Serious violence offense, act intended to cause injury, break and enter, theft, fraud, traffic, domestic violence, and etc. We also include prior offense characteristics, um, including the number of finalized court appearances for proven offense in the five years prior, um, prior proven offense types and prior penalty types, including imprisonment, home detention, periodic detention, suspended sentence, community service order, and driver license disqualification. And the last control variable is a very important one. So it's called the LSIR score, so which stands for the level of service inventory revised. So this is an assessment tool which seeks to classify an offender's risk of reoffending as well as to identify their particular criminogenic need. So a low score indicate a low probability of committing future offense, and a high score um, indicate high probability. And the LSIR data will provide it to us by um, Corrective Service New South Wales. Now, ideally, to assess causality, individuals are assigned randomly to treatment and control groups, or intervention and control groups. Random allocation minimizes the selection bias, and it maximizes the likelihood that the measured or unmeasured um, confounding variables are distributed equally, um, which means that any difference in the outcomes between the two groups is attributable to um, intervention only. So this is a setting of a randomized control trial, RCT, which is considered as a gold standard for assessing causality. However, in many situations, you can imagine random allocation is not possible due to um, practical, ethical, or social constraints. Just like in our case, we cannot randomly allocate um, offenders to the ICU or short prison um, groups. So one way to balance the observed characteristics is through a weighting procedure. So the, the idea of weighting is not new. Um, in a survey example, um, we use weighting to make the sample look more like the population if the sample is not quite representative of the entire population. And we want to use weighting in the context of estimating causal effect. So now, suppose there is a gender difference between the treatment and the control groups, so, such that male, so this is a male, <laughs> males, they are more likely to be in the treatment group. Now, some of these males even though they are very similar to other males in every other measurable way, these males, they ended up in the control group. So to estimate the causal effect for this group of males, it makes sense to compare the outcome. 
of the few males in the control group with the outcome of the males in the treatment group. And because we have lots of them in the treatment group and only few of them in the control group, we can upweight the males who are in the control group by giving them more importance and downweight the males in the treatment group because we have lots of information on them already. Now, of course, in reality, we rarely just have one difference between the two groups. And as you've seen previously, there are many characteristics that are different between the ICO and the short prison sentence group. And the propensity score method is a way where you can come up with a single score predicting the probability of receiving treatment, where you take all these different factors into consideration. So they are used to balance observed factors, differences between the treated and untreated group to obtain an unbiased estimate of the treatment effect. They are typically estimated through a multivariable logistic regression model, um, or it can be estimated using some machine learning methods such as regression trees. And you can use them in several ways, such as matching, stratification, and the, the weighting method is what I used in this study. So a popular propensity score approach is to use them to obtain a probability weight for each subject to create a so-called pseudo-population in which the observed variables and the treatment assignment are independent of each other. So for those receiving the treatment, i.e. the ICO penalty in my case, the weight is simply the inverse of the propensity score, PS. Um, and this is known as um, the inverse probability of treatment weighting, IPTW. And for those who did not receive an ICO, those in the prison group, the weighting is the inverse of the one minus the PS. So those who are underrepresented in the treatment group are given proportionally high weights. And those who are highly represented are given lower weights. Now these unstabilized weights can have the disadvantage that we can have an extreme weights if someone's treated but has a very low propensity score. So it's suggested in the literature to use stabilized weights. Um, An additional strategy to address the problem with um, large weights is just to use trimmed, <coughs> trimmed or um, truncated weights so that um, extreme weights are set to um, less to extreme values. Mm -hmm. And in my study, I used both of these methods by doing truncation after um, stabilizing the weights. So just to illustrate the idea I just sort of talked about, so let's consider someone whose probability of receiving treatment is 0.8. So he's highly likely to receive the treatment. And he ended up in the treatment group. So his weight is 1 over 0.8. So his weight is 1.25. Now we have someone else who's very, very similar. And his probability of receiving treatment is also, one, is also 0.8. <coughs> However, he ended up in the control group, this guy here. Um, now he's rare and valuable for our comparison purpose, and we give him more weight. So his weight is 1 over 1 minus 0.8. Now, on the other hand, we have a group of people who are not likely to be in the treatment group. So for this person who's in the control group, his propensity score is 0.2. So he's not likely to be in the treatment group, and he ended up in the control group, as expected. So his weight is 1.25. But for the similar person who also has low probability of receiving treatment but ended up in the treatment group, we give him more weight. So you can see that these cases are underrepresented and they are the interesting cases and we give their data more importance. Now just like any other statistical model or method, there are assumptions um, for the IPTW method. So the first one is the assumption of no unmeasured confounding. So this means there are no unmeasured variables that are different between the two groups that may also affect the reoffending outcome. Now we need to make theoretical argument as to why we believe the study has collected all important confounders. The second assumption is the correct spe specification of the propensity score model. Um, Unfortunately, this is unverifiable, but it is suggested that you should check whether using the weighting procedure induced balance um, of the covariates between the two groups. Another assumption is the positivity assumption. 
which means that um, so all subjects must have a non-zero probability of receiving um, treatment. And we can check this assumption by looking at the mean and the minimum and maximum of the weights. And if you found that the weights um, is the mean is far away from one, and or if there are extreme values, then this indicates non-positivity. Okay, so presented in this table are the odd ratio estimates and the 95% confidence intervals estimated from the three models uh, for reoffending. So the first is a naive logistic regression model, um, and the logistic regression model with um, IPTW weights, and the logistic regression model with trend stabilized weights. So very briefly on odds ratio for those of you who are not familiar with the concept. So this is a, a statistic that's commonly used in biostatistics and epidemiology, and it's a measure of association between um, exposure and an outcome. So an odds ratio represents the odds an, an outcome will occur in the intervention group compared to the odds of the outcome occurring in the um, control group. So just give you a very simple example, if you want to compare the lung cancer among group of smokers uh, with non-smokers and we estimate an odds ratio of 10, then that means um, the group of smokers has 10 times the odds of having a lung cancer compared to um, non-smokers. An odds ratio of one indicates that the odds of the outcome are exactly the same between the two groups. And the confidence interval here just indicates uh, the level of uncertainty around the measure of effect. And a confidence interval, including one, implies that there is no significant difference between the two um, groups. So we found um, a statistically significant 31% reduction and a 27% reduction in the odds of reoffending for those who receive an ICO as compared to those who receive a short prison sentence in the logistic regression model with IPTW and the model with trim stabilized weights. And this effect was marginally non-significant with a estimated 11% reduction in the naive logistic regression model. Now we found factors um, significantly associated with high odds of reoffending, including identifying as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders, um, having a proven theft, domestic violence, breach of public order offence, um, having higher number of co-appearances with proven offence in previous five years, have prior offence of um, break and enter, dangerous or neglect and act endangering persons, theft, illicit drugs, breach of public order or against justice procedures. Uh, Reoffending was also more likely to occur more among um, who were in the um, higher LSIR risk categories. Now on the other hand, those offenders who were female, older and living out of regional areas were less likely to reoffend. We also conduct a whole bunch of checks. Um, we check balance on the observed covariance based on trim stabilized weights by running a series of regression models and none of the p-values was statistically significant and uh, this suggests the specification of the propensity score resulted in a weighted sample with comparable balance um, across the ICU and the prison group. We also checked the mean and the range of the trim stabilized weights um, and there was no evidence of non-positivity of the propensity score model. So just a quick recap of what we've done so far. So we found that many variables that are different between the ICO and the short prison group that might also affect the outcome. So these variables are confounders. Now if a confounder is observed and can be measured, for example age, indigenous status, then we can adjust for it using propensity score method, for example. So one of the assumptions of the IPTW is that there is no unmeasured confounding. But what happens if we do have, if the confounder is not observed? Okay? For example, there might be some unobserved factors, such as offender characteristics that correlate with both the choice of penalty and the reoffending outcome. Now in this case, this is known as endogeneity problem, and this would bias the estimate of the treatment effect of an ICO on reoffending. In some situations, we can find an instrument. Now this instrument is not a musical instrument that you can play with. Uh, it's made a bit of a joke. Uh, so an instrument is a, a measurable quantity 
that's correlated with the treatment and is only related to the outcome via the treatment. So in our case, we are interested in looking at the causal effect of the type of penalty offender receives, whether it's an ICO or short prison sentence, on whether someone re-offend or not. However, there may be unobserved or unmeasured factors that affect both the, pen the type of penalty and the reoffending outcome. Now we want to see whether we have, whether we can come up with an instrument that's causing the type of penalty received, but it has no influence on the outcome, except via the fact that influence the treatment, which in turn influences the outcome. Okay? So the key idea behind instrumental variable analysis is that the change in the treatment or the choice of penalty in our case caused by the instrument it will be unconfounded because the change in the instrument will only change the treatment but not the outcome or any other unobserved con um, confounders. So we can use this to estimate the treatment effect. So in recent years, um, a number of studies have exploited variation across judges, um, sentencing severe, severity as instrument. And we use the same strategy in this study. Although there are clear criteria um, regarding the eligibility for an ICO, there is no legal obligation on the sentencing court to impose an ICO on an offender who meets the relevant criteria. So we can exploit the variation across magistrates in their likelihood of imposing an ICO instead of a short prison sentence. And to construct the instrument, we divide the count of the ICOs by the, the total of the ICOs and the comparable prison sentence um, imposed by the same magistrate during the, spe the specified study period. So suppose we have two magistrates. The first one is more lenient uh, in the sense that um, he's more willing to give out ICO if you consider ICO as a more lenient option. Um, and we have another judge, another magistrate, who's, more, who's harsher and who's more likely to give out a prison sentence. And we have two defendants for whom we have observed information as well as some un unobserved differences between the two. Now the key is that the assignments of defendants to magistrates is essentially random and therefore is independent of offender characteristics. So we have a so-called natural experiment here. So if we compare the reoffending outcome between these two defendants, that any observed effect must be due to the subsequent differences in the treatment, i.e. the type of penalty they receive. So this is the idea behind instrumental variable. So here's just more detail for the statisticians in the room. Uh, because both the penalty choice and reoffending outcomes are dichotomous, uh, we use a bivariate probit model that jointly model the penalty choice and the reoffending outcome um, and include the instrument we've constructed. Um, in the bivariate probit model, there are two equations. So the first equation links the uh, probability of uh, reoffending and the penalty choice and other control variables, such as demographic and um, offense characteristics. The second equation links the probability of offender receiving the ICO against the instrument and other control variables. A bivariate normal distribution is assumed for the error terms with correlation coefficient rho. Um, a negative rho would indicate those offenders who receive an ICO were less likely to reoffend. And we can conduct a likelihood ratio test um, of the correlation between the error terms, and this provides an endogeneity test for penalty choice. So if we fail to reject the null hypothesis of zero correlation, then in this situation, um, we've shown that penalty choice is exogenous, and we don't need that joint estimation, and we can trust the results we get from the logistic regression model with um, propensity score adjustment. So the results from the bivariate probit model were in agreement with those um, from the logistic regression model with IPTW adjustment. So we found similar characteristics associated with high likelihood of reoffending. 
The estimate of the correlation coefficient is negative at 0 0.107, which is not statistically significant, and hence there is no evidence to suggest penalty choice is endogenous. Uh, we also perform a range of tests to see whether the instrument we construct is a strong instrument. Now, we conduct a couple of supplementary analysis for a restricted offender cohort. Now, firstly, to see whether the effect of an ICO is larger for offenders in higher-risk uh, higher offenders, uh, we restrict the study population to offenders in the medium to high LSIR risk categories. Um, and then we compare the reoffending outcome between the prison and the ICO groups. And secondly, the offender in the prison group who were released to parole <coughs> would have received some form of supervision from community corrections after their index custodial episode. And it's possible that at least for the medium to high risk offenders, the supervision received by these offenders would have closely resembled the treatment of the offenders in the ICO group. So the prison group is uh, further restricted to include offenders serving a fixed prison term of six months or less who would receive no supervision from community corrections post-release. So we perform separate analysis um, looking at the impact of ICO on, the, on re offending for the, uh, for the three groups. So group one is looking at medium to high LSIR uh, risk offenders, comparing ICO with stroke prison sentence up to two years. Group two is comparing ICO versus prison sentence group up to six months in all risk categories. And group three is where we combine the two restrictions, looking at medium to high risk offenders and compare ICO with prison sentence up to six months. So the results from the supplementary analysis are presented in this table. So group one, we look at ICO with short prison sentence up to two years among offenders in the medium to high LSIR risk categories. So here we found uh, around 20 to 30 percent reduction in the odds of reoffending, um, but most of these estimates were not statistically significant. We then compare ICO with a fixed prison sentence up to six months in all risk categories. And here we found an estimated 25 to 43 percent reduction in odds of reoffending for offenders in all risk categories. And we further estimated a 33 to 35 percent reduction in the odds of reoffending for offenders in medium to high LSIR um, categories. So just to summarize, our objective was to examine whether reoffending was lower among offenders placed on ICO than comparable offenders given a short prison sentence. In order to control for confounding, we used two approaches. The first one is a propensity score weighting method, which balanced the observed or measured characteristics between the two groups. When there is unmeasured factors that influence that might influence both the choice of penalty and the reoffending outcome we use an instrumental variable um, approach. And the instrument we constructed is the magistrate's likelihood of um, imposing an ICO. And results suggest the offenders on ICO had significantly lower odds of reoffending than those on the short prison sentence. And this is after adjusting for these observed differences. And this reduction was even larger when we restrict the prison group to six months or less who received no supervision post-release. So this result I just presented further strengthened the evidence base, suggesting that supervision combined with rehabilitation programs can have a significant impact on the risk of reoffending. So a review of ICO undertaken by the New South Wales Sentencing Council in September 2016 found that the ICO were underutilized and not really targeting offenders who could benefit from supervision and treatment. Um, so the most significant barrier to the effective utilization of ICO identified in that review was actually the mandatory community service um, work requirement. And this has led to the disparity in the use of ICO across New South Wales and exclusion of individuals for whom um, 
intervention could potentially um, benefit. For example, um, offenders with cognitive impairments, uh, mental illness, um, those with substance dependence or um, unstable housing. So the council actually recommends um, ICO as well as home detention, suspended sentence to be replaced by a more flexible community-based custodial, custodial order. And based on these recommendations, the New South Wales sentence, the government implemented reforms in uh, September last year, where home detention, suspended sentence, and existing ICO were replaced by new ICO. And in this new ICO, where rather than making these mandatory conditions, um, courts can choose to add conditions, such as home detention, electronic monitoring, uh, community service work, or um, any other requirements. And this is just the main reference um, if you would like to have more um, detail on the study. Thank you.